Gaming NBS, episode 309, being recorded Monday, September 8th. Happy Labor Day. Ah, it's September 7th. Sorry. September 7th. 7th, Brad, thanks. Sorry. Sorry. Thanks for joining us for Gaming and BS Tabletop RPG Podcast. I'm Sean. And I'm Brett. Welcome to the show, folks. Welcome back. Glad you're all on board. Sean, how the hell are you, man? I am doing fantastic yourself. Not too bad. Not too bad. I got uh, way busier this weekend than I thought I would. Friday, I had initially tried to get a game with uh, you, Wayne, and Papa Swick going. That fell apart. And then Saturday was, was a loss for that type of stuff. But I was able to get outside and do some outside stuff because the steroids that I'm on have helped mask the horrible nerve pain I have. So I'm like, wow, I feel great on Saturday. This is kind of (laughs) nice. So I was able to get some shit done. That was kind of cool. Did you get any gaming in man since we talked last? I did not get any gaming in. No, Um, not. No, I did not. Oh, I had a failure. Um, gaming fail as in you scheduled it, no one showed up, or yeah, yeah. It's we had a, a snafu on Sunday, um, but so we had we had one player that wasn't going to make it, another player that didn't, and then Hobbs. I don't. He he was he got hung up. Ah, and so that was kind of that was it. I had my Avalon game last Tuesday. Went really well. I game uh, in my little office here where I'm recording. And uh, I, I changed my camera so I can stand up because I don't like running a game when I sit, right? So I'm yelling and hollering and doing voices or whatever the fuck it is I'm doing. And later on, I walk out when the game's over and Susan and the kid's like, have a good time, did you? I'm like, why? Like, well, it seemed like there were a lot of you in there kind of all going to town. Like, yay, it worked. So I <laughs> was... Apparently, I was a little more animated than usual. I am. I am going to run Curse of Strahd for Jeff Jeff and the gang. I think they are going to have a damn good time with that one because it's different enough. I ran through Curse of Strahd myself. I think it's different enough than a lot of the other. It's It's got the D&D, D&D Watsy feel, right? But it is not Tomb of Annihilation. You ran it, you said? No, I've been through it. Oh, you've been through I, it, I was yeah. a player. And that was, of course, how Alpha ran it and bits and pieces. You know, he, he takes whatever license he takes as we did it. But it was a son of a bitch. It was tough. Yeah. It was tough. And I, I think uh, it's it's open sandboxy enough with some gothic coolness. They, I think that'll be a different flavor for him. I think they'll like it. Well, and I've I've stipulated a few things and mm-hmm. um, may, maybe not enough. But, you know, I want to do persistent injuries um, which I've gotten some pushback on. I was going to set it in Eberron, um, which I've gotten pushback on. Really? Crazy enough, I'm getting pushback only from Jeff, and I don't know why that, I mean, I don't know what it is. Does he have a specific taste or something? He's like, no, well, I want to get in Ravenloft, or? Yeah, he's he he doesn't equate Eberron to Ravenloft. Like, oh, uh, so he's you, a little more purist. Yeah, well, you know, I don't want this, like, you know, magic's everywhere, and then I want to go into Victorian era, like, Dragon oh, Brom okay. Stoker, and okay. it just does a jive, man, you know, and I'm like, just... Trust me. Yeah, it, you're going to be in Eberron a hot minute. <laughs> yeah, you're going to start there, and then the Mist of Barovia you're going to roll in. We started out in the Forgotten Realms, and guess where we ended up in? Fucking Ravenloft, because that's how that works. So, anyways, spoilers. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. But anyways, it, it, it's going to be fun. I'm doing quite a bit of research. I'm, I got a few links in die roll. That's one of the fun things. I honestly think that going into Ravenloft, if Jeff listens to this, Jeff from me to you, brother, the cool part about going into Ravenloft is being an outsider. You come in from whatever other place you're from, the realms, Eberron, Dragonlance, whatever world the mist roll into, and suck you into Ravenloft. That's part of the fun of a first time in, right? Yeah, you may have played Ravenloft back in the day, dude, but I'm serious, man. That's part of it because you're the outsider. You get to ask all the crazy questions. You don't know. When you come upon this group of uh, traveling folk or you see this, these people or these people, or you hear tales about something, 
Um, you get to ask all the questions that instead of looking at Sean and going, well, my character's from here. Do I know anything about this? You don't ever have to ask that question. That's true. That question never comes up because none of you are from here. I think that is incredibly freeing and liberating from a player's perspective. It was very fun because everything is different. You take everything at face value. Huh. Guess that's what they do here. They all drink blood on Wednesdays. Well, that's what we do. Glug, glug, glug. Oh, Jesus, a bad idea. Not that I have no idea if that comes up in the game or not. But point is, is that being an outsider and then sucking into the Ravenloft world, that's pretty cool. I think it's fun. Yeah. I, uh, so I hope, I hope they buy into it, man, because it's a good deal. I told them I don't. I told them. Here's a, pr- a primer that I found on online. Read it. And one of the things it says is, if you want to play heroes, you're you're playing the wrong, the wrong scenario. And one of the things I put in there was, I don't want adventurers. Like, if you are adventurer, pick a different background, anything. But you're not adventurer. You're a person. That has it like adventurers are for foolhardy. The you could be a soldier. You could be a uh, protector. You know you right. take those aspects. Focus on that, not the I'm here for golden glory. Right. And so, you know, that's another thing. And I told him that, and, and that's okay. Like so, of course, Jeff's response is no Indiana Jones type. <laughs> Yeah. So it's it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be interesting, and I'm it's a challenge because I really want to. And I, it says in there like, hey, if you want to go in there and combat things all the time, and and you know get gold pieces and stuff like that, it's it's not gonna be the right adventure for you. So I'm trying to set a lot of the tone up front. Which is what you, which is what we talk about, and I think is it. I think it's damn smart of you. It really is. Yes. <clears throat> because if you tell people, sometimes you can look at your crew and say, "Hey, folks, if you go on there with this mindset, I'm looking for plus two swords, and I really want to kill more dragons, and I hope I get to kill a blah blah blah." I, all right, you'll be bored, or I just hope that they change their minds. Right? right. And I think going into such a thing, doing Indiana Jones, I, it's almost like if you go to your Trail of Cthulhu, where you have your drives. Like, what makes you adventure? Well, I want to uncover hidden truths. Good, good. Have that be a driver for such a character going into Ravenloft. I want to help people, right? Look at your 5e character sheet. What are your bonds? You know, what what are the things you like to do? And uh, live to those. You know what I'm saying? Pick ones that pick ones that work, and you'll be fine. I'm I'm taking it all in. I'm gonna I'm I'm excited to do it. I'm uh, it'll it'll go smoothly. Ever you know the next question is like how many characters? I'm like you guys got six standard players and a person that may show up every once in a while. How many player character? Like how many more characters do you need? They're fine. Than seven. They're like, fine. God. They're totally fine. This like Jeff. I'm gonna strangle him. I'm gonna strangle. He's lucky. Hey. Hey, tell Jeff I went. We went. You're welcome. It. Co. Hey. Thanks, COVID. We went through it with like four. <laughs> Seriously. So I mean, and we it was it was tough in spots, but you have to play smart. And yeah. Play, and play smart is talk to people. All right. Uh, do the call of Cthulhu? Ooh, this is weird. Oh, what's this clue? Follow this thing. Don't fight everything. Right. And the beautiful things in Gothic horror is like you can meet the werewolf, the vampire, whatever it is, and they are a tragic creature. That person may not want to be, or may have no choice. Where there's a reason. And if you start piecing all the right parts together and getting names and places, dates, and times, you can be like, aha, I have the answer and I can solve this problem. But if you go in there and kill everybody before you talk to them, good luck with that. Right. Yeah, so that's what I'm going to be doing for the next few weeks. They still want to finish Mothership. So the next session I get with them, that'll be, I'll wrap that sucker up. Cool, cool, so that's cool. what I got going on. And then Delta Green uh, this Thursday. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Sweet. Yupper, man. Well, let's, let's move on. We have a show to do here. We We're do. We're almost a quarter way into it here. Yeah, let's see. Gameholecon, um, dot com, of course. Online con. Take a look. We've talked about this plenty. It's our favorite little convention. So check it out. Support them. Do your thing. Let's just jump to Random Encounters, man. We- Random encounter. This is the place where we get emails, voicemails, smoke signals, social media, all that good stuff from listeners. Sean, you want to read the first one? 
I will read the first one, Brett. Awesome. All right. So first one, Stefan Dragonspawn, our friend from Canada. He admires us in more ways than one, doesn't he, Brett? Stefan is awesome. I had the, ple- <laughs> I had the pleasure of meeting and hanging out with him and Eric Lamoureux at the only time I've ever been to Origins. Oh, my God, did the three of us have fun. We got drinking with Wayne. It was just a blast. Oh, it was a hoot. Guys, those All guys right. are good time. Good time. Keep hello, going. Ag- hello again, sexy BSers. It's been a while since I've written in, but I've been listening to all your shows. You all do a great job and are both fun to listen to. On the description on demand topic, it's something I've come across as well on both sides of the GM screen. As a player, I enjoy and try to add something interesting to the scene, uh, the story, or the action. As a game master, I've also come across some players that struggle a little when I place the spotlight on them. If I can simp- if I can si- simply go to another player, thus giving... If I could simply go to another player, thus giving the first PC some time to think about what they want to add. Uh, Not everyone is good at improv, and even the best of us can be caught flat-footed once in a while. Just give that person some time if they do want to contribute something. Smart. Yeah. When I ran a Savage World, Shane Tower, Nasty, my one shot many years ago during a virtual con, I had the pleasure to GM for players that were new to the system, the setting, and virtual tabletops. Uh, During that game, I went around the table and often asked, describe to me how your lethal blow takes the ghoul down, or what does your spell look like when you cast it? A few of them had never been asked to do this, but they all had fun adding in their two silver pieces. One of the players even wrote me a glowing review in his blog about the experience. That was a great and appreciated surprise. Keep up the amazing work, and Sean, please, please try to stay upright on the one wheel. Don't bruise that pretty face, even though I don't see it when I listen in the car. <laughs> Brett, take care of yourself. Ciao, my handsome studs. Thank you, Steph, and that's very nice of you. I do. I like the the describe how lethal how your lethal blow takes the ghoul down, and what does your spell look like when you cast it. The first time someone asked that of me, that was. The first time I remembered, actually, Sneezak, Chris, um, did that when we were playing in a... He was running some D&D for uh, some of us online. Um, it was actually a Ravenloft game, which we recorded, but then ended up losing a bunch of recording pieces, so it never saw the light of day. But anyway, he asked me, I'm like, huh, that's the oddest thing. It always had the Game Masters explaining the fight looked like. And then I thought about it, I'm like, well... Players are like, well, yeah, I'm going to swing at him. You know, I want to try to chop his legs off or, you know, whatever it is. And I think it's kind of, it's a really fun time in combat or spell casting to ask somebody, hey, do your, do your magic missiles, are they rainbow colored? Do they have, are they blue? Are they green? The, are your lightning bolts just a flash of pure white light? Or is it like a sickly green color because you're some kind of chaos mage? Oh, ooh, I like that. Oh, I like that. Yeah, I can change that. It's just look and feel, man. Who gives a shit? The effects are the same. And combat is a great place to get descriptors from people. And I also think, you know, I've not done this. I've thought about doing it, and I tend to forget. But if someone has a really good combat description, you know, if the if even if the system doesn't allow per se, you can be like, oh, that's that's wonderful. Have a point of inspiration if you're using a five E. Or hey, here's a Benny for you. Wow, that was just that was amazing. Just how cool that was. The cool factor can play into some of that stuff. So. I like it. I think that's that's a great way to get people. Kind of like we talked about thieving, and making that more interesting by having the players talk about descriptors and all that stuff. I think fighting is another great way to pull that in. Sean, any thoughts from you on that one? No. No? You good? Yeah. All right. Who's up next? We got Tom. Stefan, thank you very much, man. Take care yeah, of yourself up Stephen. there in Canada. And if things get real too shitty down here, Sean might be knocking on your door looking for a place to sleep. You never know. I am. You never know. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so Tom over in the forums comments on descriptions on demand as well. Personally, I'm not a fan, he says, especially for more detailed questions. Part of what I enjoy when playing in a campaign is the feeling that the world is known by the GM and that I'm, as a character, interacting with a fully realized world. Now, it doesn't matter if the GM is making things up on a fly because it's still their creation and we'll still have the same feel. If I ask a question about the setting, the GM says, why don't you tell me about that organization or something similar? It totally breaks the immersion for me. It tells me the GM doesn't know about that organization. It would probably not have existed in detail if I hadn't asked about it. It makes the world feel shallow or patched together. 
I certainly didn't say it's a wrong approach for those who like it. More power to them. Just something I, just not something I like myself. There's an exception to this. Before the game starts, the player comes up with a backstory regarding elements of the setting important to their character. Then I'll encourage them to detail as much as they want. It's before the game and the players contribute. So before the game starts, if people want the setting to include people, organizations, etc., then I'm all for it. I'll either allow, disallow, or modify it to work. Actually, let me expand on my ex exception above. If at any time a player wants to voluntarily provide additional information for the setting that they would like to see, an organization, an NPC, etc., I have no problem with that. It's a player telling me what they'd like to see. I'll, I'll make it fit and try to work it into the campaign. To me, that's a very different than asking the player to detail things that you as the GM haven't. Tom, I like the way, I like your tone. I like the way you approach this because you very, you said personally, I'm not a fan. You explain what you don't like and so forth. And, you know, to quote Sean, it does depend, right? Some people like this stuff and it's stuff they really enjoy. I can definitely see where Tom's coming from, Sean, where if you want even the illusion because I've said this before, I'm, we're making shit up on the spot, Game Masters, ha, ha, ha. And sometimes you flat pulling stuff out of your back pocket going, hey, yeah, and there's goblins. They're the bloody Tusk tribe, and they have a banner, and it does, da, 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 da. you make up all this shit. Yeah, but there is something to be said sometimes for the Game Master doing it. There's a level in some games or some instances and so forth, again, by depending on preference, that adds a level of authenticity or something to the game. Do you, do you feel that way, Sean? Or what do you, how do you think about that one? It's an interesting take. But do you feel that if the, if the DM says it or the player says it is one more powerful than the other potentially? From a description? Uh, no, I, no. Well, <laughs> God, you know, the it reason depends. I'm him does and Han does it depend? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really depend. It's it's. I find that if the player says, "Hey, I got an idea. I want to implement it." I think. Well, I suppose it depends. It's it, whether the game master. What I'm struggling with in my own game that relates to this is the willingness to open it up a little bit, and then the inability for players to do it a particular way. Now, on the flip side, in the Curse of Strahd game, Jeff's trying, he's not, he's actually being pretty flexible, all things considered, but, you know, he wants to be Indiana Jones, and then, you know, he doesn't want it in the setting I'm putting it in. And, you know, he thought it might warrant some discussion, like I was asking for a suggestion instead of just dictating. And yeah. so, I don't know if there's a... <laughs> So part of me is like, yes, I want players to kind of go, hey, this is what I'm thinking. This is what I want to do. And what do you think? Well, I, I don't I want to do this. I want to do that. Or my guy, I want to be really cool. And I want to be from here. And then I want to be playing this. And then part of it's like, you've got to, you're playing like an all human party and somebody makes a Kenku. Yeah. Like, and why, then you're why, like, why, why'd you do that? <sighs> It's so it's kind of like one of these. It's okay as long as I don't have a problem with it. <laughs> <laughs> like it's, I tell you, man, there is there's something to be said sometimes for everything's up for debate versus I'm running a game, and the game is I'm gonna use Savage Worlds. It's set in Eberron, and um, it's about heists. It's a heist type game. Okay, that's what I'm running. Well, I don't know if I like Eberron. This game probably will not be for you. Oh, I mean, sometimes the the dictator component is we talked about descriptions on demand. It's like, ah, oh, this is the this is what I'd like to run. We don't want to do that. OK, if we means the entire game group doesn't want to do it right, then maybe you change it up. But I don't know. It, it's tough. I've That's true. We, we've talked about pitching campaigns that kind of falls into that is that we say so much shit goes into a session zero. We should actually sit down sometime for the 300 some episodes we've done <laughs> and calculate how many session zero questions you're supposed to ask and uh, hand out the, you know, the survey will only take 20 minutes of your time. Um, <laughs> but some, some groups, some folks find it easier to be creative. If you give them a box to create in, look, it's savage worlds and Eberron. Okay, cool. I can play with that. Oh, it's, um, you know, it's Twilight 2000, 
Vietnam. Okay. Yeah, I can play with that. I that, Thank you. Sure. I'll make creative stuff in that space. Oh, it's Delta Green. Yep. Yeah, okay, cool. Got it. Um, some folks have a harder time with the real open-ended stuff. And I think that it can play into kind of what Tom was talking about and what Stefan was talking about. So, you know, sometimes when you, if things are so open, that can freak people out where they feel like there's no bounds to it. And I think if we take that idea and then flip it over there and the game and you ask the and you ask Brett as game master, hey, um, what's the name of the local thieves guild? And I go, I don't know. What is the name of the local thieves guild, Sean? That may be like, dude, I asked you because I don't know. I, Sean, don't know. I'm asking you, Brett, what is it? Right. And you're asking because I'm asking you as an authority of the setting, if you could tell me something. And I think there is a tone in a way then as game masters that we can turn, we had asked that, I don't know, Sean, you tell me into something different. You can say there is one. I haven't come up with a name of one yet though, honestly. Um, or let me check my notes, whatever it is, or there is one, I'll get a name in a minute. I can't remember what it is. The guild. Okay. Move on. You know, you, you don't have to, you don't have to go all the way, but I can definitely see where some folks to Tom's point, when they're asking the game master a question and then it gets turned around on them, some folks may say, asshole, I asked you, <laughs> you know, if I, if I knew the answer, why would I ask you type of thing? And again, as Tom clearly points out for those that like doing that, and that's different style, different approach, power to you, man, if that's your thing. And I totally get it. I think I have found for at least my home group and my own personal style. I have, I try to mix it a little bit based on kind of how it's playing at the table type of thing so anyway i get your points though sean that's <laughs> it, it's tough because you can how wide do those creative doors get opened right you know i get it i totally get it all right tom thanks man good stuff yeah thanks tom you're up all right old school dm on making thieves interesting Great episode. I especially like the discussion of establishing difficulty through narrative description and questions from the players. This method encourages group participation in overcoming obstacles. Excuse me. Instead of just, excuse me again, picking the PC with the best plus. Yes, that's a good, that's a good point, Randy. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think this is all role playing at its best, not just thieving. Preparation and good box test text can accomplish this. This is one of the reasons I don't often riff instead of reading high quality, AKA well-tested box text. Context is everything old school DM. I think that the, the box text, I think we may have touched on this, gets a bad rap because people, oh, read this to the players, oh, blah, blah, blah. read or paraphrase. Oh, how come I can't just, yeah, yeah obviously you can. <laughs> but that preparation, again, we only have a, you know, basically a paragraph and a half here from Randy on this, but I think he's got a very solid point. That description, that little bit of box text, that little bit of something, using that is, um, and even if that means you create it yourself, my buddy Nick, for example, he likes for very key events, he literally writes out descriptions like box text as if he was publishing an adventure because it helps him get a cadence and a flow and what the room looks like for, for certain things. Sometimes it's very hand wavy and other times it's like, yeah, it's a hallway. Like we're playing star Wars right now. So it's the corridor on a spaceship. You go into the mess hall, you'll have maybe a bullet point list or something, but he's written this out. So it's very easy for him to grab and push through. Yeah. You know, and I think that can be, as Randy says, riffing for some folks, isn't necessarily that easy. Um, or something that they are feel comfortable doing. So preparation, some good box text would be that pre-published or something you yourself write, even if it's just bullet points, there's some definitely some power there. And yeah, Randy, you're dead right, man. That's um I hate it when someone goes, Well, who's got the highest plus? <laughs> to try the task at hand. It is that's really kind of metagaming at its all time worse. So yes, I absolutely agree. I don't like that approach, man. So thank you. Very good stuff. All right. So got a good one here from Kyle. He hit us up on making thieves interesting. So just listen to your Thieves episode. Rogues and Thieves are my favorite classes, and Rogue Slanted Adventures are my fave to create. You show really exhibited some of 5e's weaknesses, niche protection. However, there is one tool in the 5e kit ready to help, passive checks. Take something like climbing. I like to allow rogues passive acrobatics or athletics to climb relatively simple surfaces, the uneven rock walls of a ramshackle stone building. 
the cracked facade of a cliff, etc. Other classes will be required to make a check. Oh, I like that. Even if the DC is low, there's still a chance of failure. Doing this grants thieves automatic success in climbing up to a certain level, where there's a chance for failure for other classes, reflecting their skills. Same rules apply to picking pockets. If the person getting picked is not being watchful and the victim's passive perception is lower than the thief's passive sleight of hand, it's automatic success. Whereas another class would have to rely on a role versus passive perception, introducing a chance of failure to reflect their lack in training. There's a lot of talk about situations where bad die rolls meant the wizard picks more locks than the thief. Frankly, I don't think there's any justification for ever, even allowing pick locks roll for a character who does not have the thief's tools proficiency. Think about it this way. In the real world, you could take the most nimble-fingered master of close-up stage magic, put it in front of a standard household key lock, and, no matter how staggering his manual dexterity is, if he hasn't trained himself to pick locks, his chances of opening the door are still zero, no matter how clever his her fingers are. In my games, proficiency means more than just a few extra points to your bonus. It also represents actual training and experience that determine if the dice will even come out of the bag. Love the show. Thanks for your work. Kyle, I love that idea. That is something, as I talked about for my own little D&D variant that I've been kind of cranking on, talking with my home crew and stuff we like, that they don't, they don't use it. My home team doesn't home team. My home gaming crew. Home team, yay, go team. We're number one. Um, we don't use the term niche protection. However, they love the idea of proficiency. And a couple of them have said, that's one of the things we loved about your vampire games back in the day, Brett, was that if you had a certain number of dots in something, you could just do it. It just made sense, right? If your skill was at a certain level, what does it matter, right? Sean, I think you, I've used this on a show or even with you. Anyone can climb a chain link fence. It's just a matter of time, right? The check comes into play when you're trying to climb the chain link fence and there's dogs and guys with machine guns chasing you. Then it becomes more difficult. But proficiency is a huge deal, especially when we talk about very specialized things like picking locks, picking pockets, um, arcane checks. That's one that I think is that also gets to be a bit much. Somebody who's supposed to have some weird esoteric knowledge of something and... The barbarian rolls and goes, oh, oh, look at that. Roll the 22 Americana. Uh, how come he knows more than the wizard? <laughs> well, sometimes it's just how, eh, it just, it can really, it can really kind of mess with the verisimilitude of the whole situation. So I like, I like this. I like this thought around proficiencies in 5e and other games. Do you run into that, Sean, with your, with the guys? Yeah, for sure. I, uh, I, I actually, in Curse of Strahd, whether this will come out or not, I think it's going to be... <sighs> so as we progress, like, hey, the, here's the deal. What's everybody going to play? And then people are going to post, like, hey, I'm going to play this. I'm going to play that. Party, balance, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Part of me is just, like, uh, not wanting anybody to know what the other person's class is. Like, you just, you're going to play. And you're going to be people. And then you, as a person, are going to have a certain uh, effectiveness at certain things. So if that that should come through play, in my opinion, but it doesn't. It's always assumed, like, well, you're the cleric. Go do that thing. Go do clericy stuff. Yeah. Yeah, you're fighter. Go up and punch him in the face. We don't have an arcane user. Who's going to read this thing? Come on, I. You know, part of me is like just. You are a group. You like I, but part of you wants to say, okay, you're probably going to need X or Y. Yeah, people somewhere have an MOS, right? Sure. Yeah. If I so, what'd you do in the army, Sean? I was just an army guy. I just happened to be really good at artillery. <laughs> you were trained, right? Right. <laughs> but yeah. that's also been a yeah. So there's arguments always, but I think I think there is something interesting for yes. But you wouldn't know that unless I told you. Exactly. We were just like, oh, you're. You know, your ex army. If I ask you what you did, then you would tell me. So that's, in the game, yeah, in the game, that's kind of an interesting right. approach for adventuring too. Is like, look, what are you proficient in? Well, I'm proficient in picking locks. Wow, cool, man. You're a lock picking dude. I've got some practice. Or, yeah, I, you know, exactly. But I love the idea of leaning into your proficiencies, and as a game master, I think I'm going to try to do that more when I'm running Five E, especially, is for certain things like, are you proficient in that? No, and you're not even going to be able to try it. You can theoretically understand how somebody could parkour up this wall, but unless you have proficiency in acrobatics, you're not getting up this wall type of thing. I think there's something there's something cool to be said about that. So I like that. Yeah. I like that idea. 
Next one's for you, sir. All right, so this gets into the topic. Tom writes, he comments on the forums. I think that if easy wins happen too often, then the GM is misjudging the difficulty level of the encounters. If it happens occasionally, that's good and provides an ego boost to the group. Uh, I think that even if an essay, easy essay. Essay, uh, essay win. Essay win, yeah. I think that even an easy win happens against the big bad. It could be a good thing if it's due to excellent planning on the part of the group. An exceptionally good role or a f- uh, fortuitous combination of attacks on the part of the group. A spell is cast that works particularly well in combination with another attack, for instance. That being said, if this was the actual end of the campaign and meant to be the real capstone fight of the whole game, then such an easy win shouldn't be possible. But it's up to the GM to make sure the big bad can't be taken down easily, even by good rolls and strategies. Huh. Okay. I don't know if I buy that. Keep going. Know, Keep man. going. Keep going. Yeah. Right. I'll run two annihilation ones. Um, <laughs> uh, won't we take it down e- easy? Easy to take down. Exactly how the GM does this will vary from system to system. If they take him down easily, then the GM messed up. I don't have a good answer for what to do if this happens. You have to give the group something here as long as you don't pull what I described in my text in my next paragraph. What I've hated with a passion as a player is when we get the big bad with a really effective combination of attacks with excellent rolls only to have the GM says that he escapes anyway. <laughs> we immediately followed only to be told, no, he's gone. When he, we pressed for how the only answer was, it's a genre thing. He escapes. Oh, how I hate that excuse. <laughs> that's, not, that's garbage. That is absolute garbage. <laughs> Oh, you beat up my big bad guy. I'm taking my ball and going home. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's move oh, on. Oh, so I said we should probably divulge it, right? Go yeah. to the main topic. Yeah, let's just jump, man. All right, Brett. So what are we talking about? Tom mentioned it briefly. Yeah, I want to talk about some easy wins, man. We spend a lot of time talking about the big bad in our games. And. Tom did it above, too. We talk about that a lot, helping make those encounters and fights, et cetera, be the best they can. But I think there's some value in the easy wins or quick wins. Uh, those times when that party, you, they dispatch those five goblin guards, they easily evade the stormtroopers, get an important clue without too much fuss. Um, sometimes those easy wins can be kind of cool. So, Sean, do you do you know what I'm talking about when I say easy wins? The, 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 yeah, man, softballs. Softballs? Yeah. Yeah, man, you're kind of lobbing, you know, a, a couple goblins at a party of fifth level people. You just kind you know. of grind them through. Yeah, I mean, not even a grind. You just kind of hand wave it or something like that. Or they get a couple cool moves. I think, so one of the things I found for my home group anyway, and in front of other groups I've played, when people level up and they get a new power, like, so let's take one of the classics, Cleave or Great Cleave, <sighs> where you can start hacking your way through crews of people. Actually, I think even in Osric, you have, at a certain point, you can just, like, mow stuff down as a fighter. Yeah. And these easy win times can be a great time to show off some of those cool powers and skills. Look, you can cleave through 10 kobolds all by yourself. The the bard with the silver tongue bypassing the guards because he's got this. It's, it's easy, right? He's got a plus 15 on his roll or a plus 10 in the guards. It's a DC 5 or something. It's really easy. It, quick work on the security system because your PC, she's the god queen of all hackers and she can easily get past the security system. You're like, yeah, t- t- no worries. Would you roll a six? Yeah, the DC's like a two on that thing or whatever the case is. I think for me, I f- when players get a new power, especially when it's something cool, it can be really fun to have a, to have a quick win with it. And I think a lot about D&D when I think about this, but even... And uh, in the Star Wars game, I'm playing with my buddy Nick, which he's using happens to be using D20. But even when I was playing D6, and um, it, quite frankly, when I ran tilt to green, the guy's got a hold of some high end weapons. They're like, oh, that was nice. Those mooks just pile right up when you shoot them like that. Wow, this Browning 50 cal does does great work on this type of thing. That's really amazing. <laughs> you know? And it, it's fun. 
it can be really fun to just kind of have it, it's a show off and i think it can let the spotlight land on some pcs and just show how fucking badass they are just mowing through shit i think that again like kind of like tom says you know you do it all the time not so good but what do you think sean does that sing to you do you think that there's value in that or do you think it's just kind of like popcorn it's just nah eh, tastes good but no filling what are you thinking I think there is a time and a place for it. I think that it's it can be fun. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't do it a ton, uh, sparingly for sure. But yeah, I think there's nothing wrong with being uh, being big bad, big bad evil guy, the big the big good guy, yeah. and. Yeah, 10 kobolds and cleaving. Yeah, just hack your way through them, right? Yeah. I mean, Stormtrooper, I mean, there's some systems have MOOC rules. Like, Agre- okay. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm just thinking, like, when I think Star Wars, like, Obi-Wan Kenobi just easily gets in there. He get this little hand wavy thing. What was that? Spoilers. And right. uh, Stormtrooper, oh, what was that? Oh, it must be a drill. Do, 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 do. He's just doing yeah. his thing. He's a goddamn Jedi master, bitches. He does what he wants, right? Just kind of whatever, whatever, whatever. Guy in a bar yeah. man handles him, dude loses an arm. Spoiler. It just fucking gets his shit done, you know? He's badass. And I think sometimes when you have a character that's achieved or starts out in some games as badass, it's fun to be a badass. And I think those mook rules really help in games that have mook rules specifically. Um, hell, for uh, fourth edition, you used to have that, where you could take, you know, you could have basically an ogre... With one hit point. I, I think they're called minions. Yeah. You know, and it would be giants with one hit point, right? But that's okay. They have all the rest of the attacks and stats, but they only have one hit point just to show how easily they can be destroyed. So I think that that concept built into built into games where it is built in is super helpful, right? So you can kind of challenge them with numbers and really cool stuff, but you don't have to uh, create a whole new mechanism here. I need a different chair. This chair is really squeaky. Squeak, squeak, squeak. You want to get a different chair? No, it's all right. I'll do I'll just It'll try, be fine. Just try to sit quiet. <laughs> um I, I I can't hear too much of it anyway, but good. So the other one I've thought about, Sean, is from a confidence builder perspective, when there's the big bad fight coming. And here's what I'm saying. So the players are cooking up something that they want to do. Right? Okay, they're gonna fight Strahd or they're going to um, take on a Sarak or let's go to Star Wars. They got to go fight Darth Vader. They got to go take on Boba Fett. They got to do something, right? They have to go take on the Galactic, blah, blah, blah. They have all these, they're, they're a team or hopefully they're operating as a team. And sometimes for me, large groups of easy foes to defeat in some way, when they've done it, it's a confidence builder. Hey, wow, I didn't realize you're your sneaking stealth ability was that goddamn incredible. She should be our scout going into the Death Star. Wow. He's amazing at this thing. I didn't realize you could cast Chain Lightning. That changes our entire combat strategy. And play, characters have all this cool shit that they can do. And those combo moves, like Tom was talking about, you know, a really kick-ass combo fight against the big bad guy, whether that's the thing that takes uh, he or she down, whatever. But I think... Sometimes getting getting that idea flowing, that creativity in combat, sometimes that happens with those easy wins, right? There's a horde of hobgoblins, bugbears, and hill giants come running at your 10th level party. And a horde is whatever number you want to make up a horde. And your 10th level party of five or six players just makes mincemeat up, just grinds right through it. Dun, 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 dun. Huh. How'd you do that? Well, we used a fireball. I did this. I called the bag over here. I did that thing, that thing, that thing. Wow. That's fucking cool. It, they get to knock the dust off the tactics. The other thing for me is um, with the confidence builder, too, is when I haven't played in a while with a group, when I was not gaming with the guys except once a month, depending how much time has passed, I'll get the game going. It's very traditional. I'll throw a small, easy combat at them just so they can knock the dust off the character sheet. And go, oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I have a plus five to hit. I forgot about that. Holy crap, am I amazing. So I find value in that from a confidence builder, not only just as from a character perspective, but as a player piece. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. 
And then, yeah, no, that would be something to throw at a party right away, or it, it doesn't matter when you throw it at them, actually. Yeah. But yeah, I think confidence is probably one. One is to have them do their fun hokey pokey, hokey pokey dance. Yep. You know, their great cleave, whatever the case is. And yeah, okay, do your super fancy moves and make it look cool. I mean, you look back at the old X Men comics, Colossus and Wolverine had the fastball special. Colossus would pick Wolverine up and chuck him into hordes of sentinels, which are these anti mutant robots. He just slashed the shit out of them, right? It's a big ball of sharp adamantium hurling at them at incredible speeds. Yeah. That's used to take down mooks, and that's cool. And they don't, that's a move they had to figure out, right? By training and working together as a team. I just think that's kind of cool. That type of thing. Yeah. There is one of the things that Tom mentions above. It doesn't get me, Tom, so I'm not saying that that irks me. But I, I think, for me anyway, I don't believe every battle event, we're talking the easy wins here, most we're focused on fights, but I think we can get to other stuff too. But not every battle has to be a true test of your skills. Right? If using CRs, well, a CR12 is what would be a challenge for our players. Everything doesn't have to be a CR12 challenge. You know what I mean? Not everything no. needs to be set up as an absolute true test. And I think that's that is the thing I have found. I had to have that I had this discussion with my son AJ last time he ran something. And I'm like, dude, every fight doesn't have to. He's like, oh well, yeah, that's a good point. I'm like, look, we're we're doing okay here, but holy crap, man. <laughs> every every room in this dungeon get shouldn't be good. Jesus, we're gonna die. You know. It was disheartening because every thing we encountered was a, a true test of our abilities and our powers I had to leave the dungeon like what well, that's it we're done go long rest somewhere else because we can't move on so what do you think about that sean does the do you think are you i assume you're agreeing with me but if you don't say so yeah no i agree it's yeah so do you plan like um the easy wins or do you just look at your huh well because well, if you're running pre-published you could say wow this one ought to be easy or do you ever tone them to create easy wins or you just they just turn into easy wins? Um I I don't know if I consciously sit down and put down put down an easy easy win fight. Tomb of Annihilation I would have had my chances to do that to some degree. Okay. I wasn't adverse to it. I think I ran it, you know, oh it's this encounter, it's got six of these mooks or creatures or whatever it is okay i ran it as kind of as written um you know could i have nerfed it just kind of hand wave it or if they were deeper into the jungle and higher level and they came across creatures that didn't have a lot of beef behind them you know i i I guess i didn't take advantage of that component of what i could have done um i'm not adverse to it and i think that um Curse of Strahd might be an interesting one. Like I probably <sighs> let me throw let me let Depen- me throw this at. It depends on the game. Like yep. Mothership, I don't I don't I don't think I want. No, that's on that no. One. I don't think that that's a very good point, honestly. Because in that game, well, I'll tell you what. Let, let me throw this at you here. I think the other piece that easy wins have from a value perspective is not just value for the players. Like, hey, they get confident, they get to be show offs, and they get some limelight. From a game master perspective. You get to use resources from your players. They're, they're right. casting spells. They're doing stuff. Because unless they're absolutely positive that they can take out these four ogres without the wand of fireballs, they might use the wand of fireballs. Because why do you have the wand of fireballs if you don't fucking nuke stuff? Right. right. So in the jungle, let's say in, in Tomb of Annihilation, a, a T-Rex attacks them. Right? So let's say a T-Rex, smash, smash, smash. They defeat it fairly easily. They used how many spell slots? Who got hurt? Well, no one got hurt. Okay, so they're not down to hit points. But the spell slots, they wasted time. So the other thing that happens is they win. But they win and they notice a small little chip on their resource clock, right? And their little resource calendar, their timer, something is used up. So from a Game Master perspective, I think there's some value there too where you're you're chipping away at stuff and implying there's danger. Not all dangers and threats are a true test of your stamina, ability to survive, and so forth. But 
it's a hassle sometimes. What do you think about? I, I think that to me feels like mothership. Where the way you've described it to me, okay, we we patched it, we've got oxygen, okay, cool. What did you do to do that? Well, we sealed off the mess hall and kind of had to. Yes, yeah, so we have no food. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I got the, I got the quote unquote easy win. I got a win, but it ate something away from us. That's what I think about when I think about an easy win for a mothership game based on your description. Part of me, part of me wants to consider a scenario where you parlay with the group and say, all right, here's the deal. You've got whatever in front of you. You could probably easily take them. Um, it's going to take a little effort, maybe a little time, um, we could certainly roll through this. You'll win. There's no question. But the que- the the question is at what cost? Um, little or to none? Maybe you could like roll the dice and see what happens. Or hey, scratch off a spell. Uh, t- like hand it out to the players. Like here's the deal. In order to kind of make make this through, here's what I want you guys to do. Scratch off a total of X amount of hit points, one spell. Uh, if you've got like disposables that were keep a track of like arrows. You could do a random you, chart for that, man. You could do that or you could just put out what it is and they have to decide what to do with it. Oh, I, I have this vision of a deck of like a deck of many things. Like, all right, we're going to overland travel. Sean says if we just want to get from here to the to the dungeon. We can avoid the overland travel because we're going to get there. But we get to pick from the deck of overland crap. Let's see what happens. Flip. Oh, I lose uh, two spell slots of my choice. Fuck. What do I lose? I lose a week's worth of food. Shit. What do I lose? I lose this. Ah, oh, I lost 10 hit points. That's no big deal. I got the fighter. I got hit points to spare. Yeah, I There's mean, it some, could that be. Is inter- I, don't know if I, I don't know if I get my, my group to play that way, but. Well, part of that is. Pretty random. Yeah, no, and, I'm just saying. There's, it's yeah. got, you could. I, I was just thinking the random aspect, but I like the idea too of like, like, look, here's the deal. You give me this, I'll give you that. Right. Just hand out like, you know, you've got. You could feasibly plan this out where the characters are going to be going. You know, okay, what encounters am I going to have? All right, if they go this route and then they go this route, they may not have to fight it, but do they want to fight it? All right, if they do fight it, it's probably an easy encounter. I don't want to roll it all out and spend an hour to get through it. However, I got to get them to I got to get them to sacrifice some things. Like they're just not going to get through it and they waste 10 guys period nothing. Like no scratch, no hit point, no spell. They just okay, there's 10 people in a room. You guys walk in there, you're done, whatever. Um Sean from table to uh Tabletop Bellhop mentioned Encounter Deck and Gloomhaven does exactly oh, kind of what we're talking about. I've never about. played yeah. Gloomhaven. No. I'm a board game, but heavily on the RPG I, bend. I got a story. Let me throw this at you. This is board Have you ever played Return to the Temple of Elemental Evil, the Monty Cook adventure? I have it. I've started reading it. I have never it's, run it's it fun. or read the whole I've thing. I've read it. It's fun. So if no one wants to spoil this, it's been out for a while, but there is. So spoiler. Seriously. Seriously. Spoiler here. There is, Sealer, seriously, spoiler. So there is a, um, there's a vampire in there named Thrommel, <gasps> right? Shit. And yeah. the way it's written, my buddy Lenny said, boy, it feels like just, and he was looking up on board. I may have told the story before on the show, he's just back. But the way the monster's written, it's just like, huh, it's a monster in a room. And Lenny was doing some research online, talking to other game masters who've run it, and they all went, no, that's bullshit, man. It's a goddamn vampire, anti-paladin lord jesus he should be so he played him way critically tougher really hard we smoked him we it took it was a bitch it was a pain in the ass and the only and the main reason we got him was lenny said okay i gotta go put the kids to bed you guys have as long to plan you guys have as long to plan as it takes (laughs) ha ha bad idea on him what happened though was after that everything became easy we went from we went through like six rooms back to back to back to back didn't take a scratch. Smashing the door, fireball. Smashing the door, fire. We smoked everybody in two rounds. No one got hurt. Wham, 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 wham. Well, he played that dungeon as a living thing. One of the downsides to all of our easy wins was everybody left. All the cult heads went, we're out of here. And they bailed. They went, this is dumb. We're going to leave and start over. People, 
there was like there's internal strife within the elemental evil cults about, against this against that and they just started packing up once we took out two complete temples the rest of them started getting wiggy people are fleeing they're deserting and it just it we made it we got to a certain point where we were just crushing 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 and uh it basically we got to end there was nothing there it, it short version much longer detail in it but it was it was interesting where we kind of got there and went huh wow we had like this fight we kind of thought there'd be a huge one at the end too but wow we really just didn't it, it was just kind of a weird knock-on effect if you will of super easy pieces and that i tell that story to connect it to tom's piece about where the bad guy gets away where the big bad runs off that's what happened to us but it made sense because as we're smashing our way through this dungeon by the time we would have gotten them they're like fuck all that escape routes taken everybody bailed so that just um, that made some sense to me, in in a way, and again, kind of took us off track there a little bit. But I just just this this talk about these these small ideas and kind of saying, hey, <clears throat> we could roll through this, or I could just take this, right? We could just take a, an out, like you're saying. I think there's, I think that idea, had Lenny done that type of thing, it would have been a different adventure. Saying you're looking at the room and saying, "Wow, they just smoked two of these entire rooms of people." Bam, bam, no problem. They're crushing through the fire temple. Okay, guys, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. You're going to get through this section of the map. We had a map, you know, we got a map off of somebody. You're going to get through this section, no problem. However, we can either run the risk, roll the dice, do, do or I'll take this, 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 and this from you, and I'll just say you have it. That's a different game. That's a different mindset. It's a different approach for us. And um, because we weren't hurt, because we got really lucky because of how the dice rolled, that was just pure luck on our part. It changed how we approached the rest of the dungeon and how he approached it from that side. But I'm a fighter. I'll take 50 points of damage there. Fine. If that gets us through six rooms, I'll take 50 points right now. Yeah. I would have done that which would have totally changed how we approached the rest of the room. And quite frankly, I think it would have changed how the main bad guys would have seen us. We were vulnerable because we, sure, we took out six rooms, but we were hurt or had our shit kicked out of us. So, sorry, that just got, that I mean, just got me thinking about that. I like that idea, Sean. I really do. There's not necessarily a, a problem with letting them walk through, you know, there's six level and you want to throw them some goblins. But I, I, some of it also has to not be just this weird kind of, you know, a weird kind of thing. Like, you know, I, I would find it strange where you're – Doc has done this and it was in a situation where it wasn't strange necessarily. Mm -hmm. It was something where we were going and we ran into something and he's like, look, you guys mop up the place. And that was kind of it. And – and that's fine, and I, I think that situation warranted itself, but there are somewhere, if you have that approach, it may f may be out of place. Like, oh, they're just, they're sixth level, and there's, oh, a bunch of goblins show up, like, out of the blue. You know? Uh, uh, huh? Huh? You know, okay, you guys waste them all, it's all good. Yeah, just, I mean, I guess you're saying making an easy win for the sake of throwing one in there? Type of thing. Yeah, yeah. It's got to be. It's there's got to be kind of a. I mean, it has to fit. Maybe has to have a flow. Has to have yeah. reason to be there. Yeah, you're on a planet. Yeah, so far you guys have you know taken out every galactic cop who's come after you. Why would the galactic cops be here? <laughs> you know, type of thing. I mean, there's there, no stormtroopers here. Why are they bothering us? Yeah. If you think about role playing games and movies, and you look at it and play Lord of the Rings, and they're in the mines of Moria and they've hold themselves up in that room and they're in the tomb and they, well, they don't hold themselves up. They're in the tomb and then the, the big cord comes yep. in and they're like, Oh shit. Yeah. They're going to take care of all those, the, the, the mooks yep. in there, all the minions, but they got a troll or they got a lot. Yeah. So it's not a, you know, how do you even, and that's mass. I know we're starting to get into the, the verge, you know, verging on the, mass combat of things but you there's a balance there too like okay of course we're not going to have one of these little 
orky goblin guys kill freaking Aragorn. Yeah, it's going to be the troll is going to be the one that smashes Boromir into the wall or whatever the case happens. Yeah. No, I hear you. And, and you cut, so what do you do? Do you, you want to roll that and see what happens or do you want to get them through still? And I still think there's got to be a trade off like, hey, you're going to get through this, but I need you guys to like take a few levels of exhaustion for sure. And then take a few hit points and a few spells, and then we're going to be good. And how you do that, I don't care. But I think they could just, you could hand wave it and say, yep, you get to the big chasm and you go across. And then. Belrog. Yeah. The, <laughs> then all hell comes down and it's Belrog time. I like I like the, the minions, the mooks, those type of rules in mass combat, I think, is kind of where it's at for the easy win or the. This this isn't meant to be a threat. It's meant to wear you down. It's meant to get in your way, right? You've got a huge thing yeah, to right. do. The troll is the problem. The orcs and the goblins in the chamber, um, more of a pain in the ass than anything else. They're in the way of me getting and doing damage to the troll. So the fact that they can, in movie-wise, of course, book much different. They can dispatch, 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 and finally focus on the troll. That took rounds, you know, in D&D terms. That takes a while to get to it, you know. So the other thing here, too, if we take combat out from easy wins, I do think some of the, the easy wins for skills, we talked about that above, what making thieving interesting and proficiency. Sometimes I think that is, that's another way to be badass, right? Um, uh, Knights Black Agents, uh, Gumshoe Games, they're kind of, they're big on that. And um, even in, shit, I'm losing it. I have another game system. I can't remember what it is. But anyway. If you're really good at something, like, hey, look, we're playing Call of Cthulhu. Well, I've got a, I got a 65 percent that you do that easily. Christ, it's, it's, it's anything. You know, what's your background? I'm a mechanic. Yes, you can get the car started. I don't want to dick around with it. You're, you're a skilled mechanic. That's your job. You figure out how to plug the wires back in. You're fine. Just move on. Let's go. Do I need to roll? Why bother? Let's just go. I need right. to climb this chain link fence. Yes, you can climb the chain link fence. Why? Because you're a thief by nature. This is just what you do. Getting in isn't difficult. Let's start at where it gets hard, you know, and I'm kind of in my one example of um, my buddy Eric did this. We were playing Shadow on this ages ago, a long, long time ago, and we were infiltrating something or Decker. We're going to try to get plugged into something. We're busting through, busting through. He's like, look, you get over here, you get there, you sneak, you move. It's actually not that bad. It's kind of creeping you guys out. And it, basically, we made it in past the perimeter. We found the outdoor security was nothing. Our deckers, bam, we're in past this. We're by my mouth. This is getting creepy. This is weird. We're in too easy. What is going on? And then we find the thing in the middle. Oh my God, what is this? It was this huge, crazy, super top secret military thing way over our heads. Everything goes to shit from there. But the outside was just a facade. It was like this just half ass thing just to keep people away. Um, so we had all these easy wins, and from a Game Master perspective, they're all skill checks that were just, you do this, easy. What do you do? Yep, that's the right thing. You're in, you're in. And the creep factor went, oh, God, this is too easy. <laughs> Why is this so easy? Why is he letting us have this? And we got absolutely fucked. We were proper to be paranoid because we almost died. But um, I think skill checks from an ease perspective can move things along, too. Because that's the other piece for me is that if the door is locked... And the door being locked is not interesting, other than the fact that it's there to slow you down or the description says something, then the thief picks it easily. Moving on. Is he proficient in lock and thieves tools? Yes. Click, click, click. You're in. You're in. You keep moving. Now, it's difficult when that person isn't there. If we'd lost our Decker, we lost the, you know, we lost her. She didn't know how to, you know, we, we don't have anybody to bypass the computer security system. Now things are a problem. Does that make sense, Sean, from, uh, from the skill side? Yeah. I'll add this piece just to super clarify. For me, the easy win on the skills sometimes is a time saver just for benefit of the group. Like what's the what's the point right. of dicking around? We get in there, can you lock the door? Yes, you like you can lock the door. Okay, good. We get in, we lock the door. Technically they don't have a key. I should make the th I should make the thief roll the CP and lock the door. But I'm not doing that. He can get in, he can lock the door. Can we tighten it? Yes. Is there a percent chance you didn't tighten it properly? Possibly. I don't care. Right. Sometimes those quick skill checks are pretty simple, and they're they're so dirt simple that somebody who's proficient in it should just know what it is. Yes, there's always the chance, but it's not a real world simulation. This is a role playing game, 
and sometimes just move on. It's again, it's not a big deal. If failing it isn't incredibly interesting, as many people have, other than us have said over the years, then what, why make people go through the checking to see if they can climb a ladder? Right? Right. Because if they don't climb a ladder in two seconds, is it on fire? Are they being shot at? Does something bad happen? No, then fuck it. Who cares? They climb a ladder. Everybody can climb a goddamn ladder. Right? Not that big a deal. Right. So anyway, where I was going at with the combat easy win, I think we think about wins sometimes. It's strictly fights. You know, getting past mooks, stormtroopers, and so on. I don't think you necessarily have to plan for them as well. Or, uh, But sometimes, if it's easy, that's okay. You know, as Tom said, it's going to happen sometimes. Somebody might smoke something. We could talk about this from a big bad guy perspective in a different show. But sometimes, wow, this this is four, uh, four hobgoblins and six trolls, man. This could be a brutal fight. Oh, they're, wow. Wow, you guys, you guys just did that. Holy shit. Wow, you just broke into that compound, uh, got the got the captive out with uh, out of shot fired. I didn't think you guys could do that. Fucking hey, that's pretty cool. Sometimes shit's easy, and, it, and that's okay. And um, I don't think game masters should feel that we have failed, or that there's if it wasn't a hard enough test. Oh my god, I should have made that more difficult. We'll say that shit. You know, oh, you got it too easily. Oh, I can't blow off the dice. Have been bad for you. But sometimes it's also for me, man, it's honestly fun. Players put together a really cool plan. The dice are rolling high. Like, I can't stop you tonight. That's fun sometimes. You watch your players' faces light up and they're just giggling because they just can't stop tonight. For whatever the reason is, they just can't not win. The other shoe is going to drop eventually. And then, and then eventually. when it drops, like, oh, yeah. I guess that ride's over. <laughs> it's going to be a big shoe, and it's going to drop hard mm-hmm. and fast. But I think yeah. in in the pre-published stuff, Sean, like that you're running, I think the some of them, depending on the type of dungeon or whatever type of adventure is, they may not have easy wins type of thing built into them. But I honestly think having played, did you ever play in Ravenloft? With Doc? Uh, I did play in Curse, Curse of Strahd. Strahd. So I've pl- I have played it, but it is... I mean, it was a, quite a while ago. It's right, oh, not soon after it came out. And it's been oh, out yeah. for a little while now. But I think the players in there, man, are going to find out that there's different types of win here. Right? The easy win is sometimes talking to the right person in the right way. Or finding something out and avoiding the fight, it's, you know? It's, it's going to be, be it is going to be an interesting game. And I posted on our private Facebook group to go off on a little bit of a tangent. Brett and I were starting to broach a subject a little bit before the show. And it was, I don't know, it, there is BX, which I can appreciate. And then there's what I would consider like 5e era, 3.0 era, mm-hmm. whatever. And one of the things I brought up was because in uh, I probably should kind of divulge this in Curse of Strat, I want to there I've absorbing a lot of Reddit on it and some player guides and it's always interesting to run an adventure after about a year or two after it's been out because then you could learn from other people's mistakes how it's run how it's flow that was how the that was how Lenny got Thrommel, right. Like I said, he's, right. oh, wow, other people have done this already. Ooh, neat, I'll do that. Yeah. How some encounters are relatively stupid or breaks kind of the continuity of of the feel or whatever that is, like especially if it goes one way or the other. And I, I don't know, maybe we brought this up to somewhat and touched on it, but s- s- part of me is like, hey, I want these guys to go in. And I told Brett, I'm like, they can't be adventurers. They have to be they could, they're obviously a player character class, but they're going to have to be somebody. And that somebody is like a working stiff, a diplomat, whatever it is. But adventuring is not, this is not the adventuring adventure group. You're not, that is for the foolhardy, the danger thrill seekers, uh, the people that don't have a home. And so fast forwarding, if they get into the curse of Strahd, and it's if they play that type of way, my understanding is they probably aren't going to have a really great time because it doesn't facilitate 
that killing type monsters of play. and taking their stuff is not its primary goal. Right. A much of it is understanding who, where they are, who they're going to interact with, what those roles, those non-player characters, yeah, all play. those different categories and stories, and how what weaves in where, what's connected, what's not connected. Yes. Who are you going to need to leverage? Who who is bad and who is good and who can you use to, to help you? Have to go you? say you're sorry to you because you accidentally pissed them off when you first got here. Yes. Right. And that's a game that appeals to me because I th- there is a time and a place for a different type of game. I get that. but I'm, And I'm also trying to, you know, say to, to the group that I play with, and have played with for a long time. Like, hey, here's kind of the deal. So my the and I posted it on this Facebook. I might as well get to this post on the Facebook group. I mentioned I don't know where this shit changed. Where what for whatever reason, whenever something's thrown at a group, they gotta tackle it with the utmost gusto. You can't retreat. You don't run away. It's it can't be completely. I mean, it should be. We should be able to overcome this because it should be fair. It should be fair. The CR is in line. Why would Sean send Count Strat at us when we're first level? That's that's some straight up bullshit. And so part of me is, you know, so I got that thing going on and I'm trying to, to, to smooth that over. And I don't know how that ties into the main topic, honestly. <laughs> well, it's, it's part, of the, part that, of the thing for easy wins is sometimes I found out where some of the value comes in for this for me. I was, AJ and I were out um, uh, taking a walk or something the other day, and I was talking to him just about DVD stuff, which he wants to, likes to do with me. Yeah, you should start yeah, a she podcast. Yeah, totally should, my son and I. <laughs> Probably run better than this one. Well, he's guy. pretty technical. Um, <laughs> Freaking producer. But he, um, he was talking about CR and how he's like, you know, it was really helpful for me, Brett, when I started, because then I could figure out what was or wasn't challenging, because sometimes I didn't want to challenge them. I just wanted them to have fun, like you told about. I said, oh, yeah, that's cool. I said, there's a group of guys I played with back when I worked, God, like, ex-wife, ages ago, blah, blah, blah. I got this group of guys I'm gaming with. And uh, who is it? Was, you know, you know Chris, the security guy. My buddy Chris. So I got Chris, Eric, Doug, and uh, yes. Jan, and a handful of guys. And they are tactical goddamn masterminds. I was running 3-0 and then 3-5, and I'm trying to be even and fair and challenge them and i swear to god if it was not two to three times the sierra level they ate it because there's five of them against my brain they just destroyed me. right sure. destroyed me and it was fun i had to pull out shit um at one point we got they got a little cranky with me because the devil showed up like oh my god we can't fight this blah 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 blah, blah. and then I, I did my thing right i tone it tune it like it's fine. You can. It's within fair, but I have to have some something to beat you guys with because I can't. You want to be challenged? I threw a lich at you. You ate it. So I'm coming up with other stuff. Okay, guys, you dicks. So it was just a running joke. The first time they right. played Avalon with me, I said it just bards and rogues, man. So I made thieves and bards, and these guys are min max motherfuckers from the word go. They show up. They the if you rolled low <laughs> on initiative, you were in the high <laughs> teens, and they would mock each other. So this is back oh, when you were flat-footed, kids. So if you're flat-footed, your AC is lower than usual. So yeah, surprise round, which they always got. Surprise, their opponents are flat-footed, lower AC. Hit them, hit them, hit them. Okay, now for it's the real round. Start the start the bidding off at AC, at you know initiative thirty and down. Hey, guess where the players are at the top? And because of the way flat-footed works, the bad guys haven't moved yet. They don't get their full AC yet. So two full rounds of attacks from them on flat-footed AC. With backstab, flanking, grind, 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 grind. If they didn't take out the bad guys in three rounds, they ran away. Because they knew if they stuck around too long, they had piss poor hit points. They got the shit kicked out of them. Gorilla fighters. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking brutal. I was hard yeah. put to challenge them. Those fights were easy wins. So the challenging stuff had to come into the psychological piece. One of them ran into a, a beast lord. I, like the, the, the cat lord from the old fiend folio. Pulled him out. Lycanthropes. Weird shit happening in the neighborhood. That started, that became the actual challenge. Where's it coming from? Which is kind of a Strahd thing, right? Some of the, some of the, you're trying to figure out what is going on is the challenge, not how many goblins did I kill type of thing. 
So that just became a different way to go. By. But I, I guess where I'm going, I have to tie back into easy wins. There is really <laughs> hard sometimes to challenge certain groups. Some groups are really, really good at stuff. And uh, here's a Dracolich, ate it. Okay, um, two Dracoliches, yeah, anything else? And they just had a blast. They thought that was fun. And we had, for whatever reason, that group and I, that was our dichotomy. Oh, let's see if, let's see, let's see what Brett cooks up this night. I bet we can kill it. <laughs> that was just part of our fun. Maybe nobody else ever wants to play. Like, it was just a style that we had. It just developed. It's a style yeah. of play. And I think that's one of the, the focus that I have is to determine whether the style of play that is going to be facilitated through this scenario or any scenario is going to be the type of play that they want. And going through, going back to this is, you know, how easy do you make things? How how do they know if they're over challenged? And and so, going back to the MOOC thing, it's it's or going through easy wins. Um, it, I'm totally not even touching That's on right. that, but it's our show, dude. <laughs> it's, I'm not That's sure why, show, but anyways, it's how my brain is starting to work. But it's a I th but it's a fine line between both. Like, I think you got to, because there's going to be times at, at the same time, Brett, if you hand wave this with the wrong group, they're going to, they're not going to like that at all. They're going to be like, wait, man, I don't care if there's 50 goblins, man. I want to roll some dice and you I, kill all the goblins. I want to kill the goblins. I don't care if I got great cleave. It's kind of like, and in all fairness to the players, it's going up those levels and getting those cool feats and those little, little treats and not being able to use yeah, the treats. I have I have this really cool thing. I finally got, and I can't use it. Yay! Hey, boo. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, yeah, style is style is big on this stuff. And sometimes, I think the other piece, too, when we talk style, to tie it into easy wins, I know for a fact that my home group enjoys them sprinkled in. They love to be able to show off their cool powers and beat the fuck out of some something, whatever it is. Yeah. If they go down and they take out some kobolds or they, they manhandle the guards or they, they they get whatever they need to get, <laughs> they like that. They like to have that. And then they, oh, that's tough. Then they you know, they roll up on some dude, start pushing him around, and then suddenly this big blast of psychic power hits him. Like, oh, well, this is interesting. This isn't easy anymore. Wow, what the fuck was that? You know? So anyway, I just, I think to kind of wrap on this one here, and we'll, of course listeners whatever you all think or if you've got experience with it or how you like to use it do you plan them do you just kind of roll with them when they happen but i think we as game masters and even players sometimes but game masters especially we can be like oh it was too easy it was too easy it's okay yeah if everything is too easy perhaps that's a problem because it might not be what everybody's after we want to challenge periodically but sometimes should sometimes a fight's easy sometimes a skill check is easy and that is totally okay not everything, much like every monster fight, doesn't have to be a fight to the death, because that's not how anything works all the time. It doesn't have to. And not every skill check or every fight has to be a complete true test of your skills and abilities. So, we good, man? All right. All right. Let's get into die roll before my video blows up or something. I don't know what the hell's going on. Die roll 1 to 2d4 miscellaneous points. Game of the Geekery. Let's get through this shit, man. God did blast it all. How to create your own kingdom's history. Article on role-playing tips. Cool. Yeah, check that out. Looks cool and fun. Oh, I like that. And that's what we're all about here at Gaming and BS. Sometimes those those little nuggets like that, sometimes you read them and you're like, huh. Oh, I kind of do that. Sometimes it's refreshing. Oh, I already do that. Neat. I'm good at something. And sometimes like, huh, I don't do that one thing. I'll take that. That's good stuff. Numero two, Kobold Fight Club. Online tool. Yeah, online tool for building monster encounters. Nice. Very, and it's very quick and very dirty. Uh, it's, I brought it. Somebody were like, again, one of my Curse of Strahd, like, hey, this is how you can run it. Pointed this out. So if you needed to beef up some encounters on the fly, you just put in the player levels. And Poison Strike and Pseudo Dragon. I'm just clicking random. Guard, Mastiff, Steam Mephit, Dark Mantle, Violet Fungus. <laughs> you could change the environments, all kinds of stuff. So for people that are like, dude, go ball clubs for rules. How could you not know that? Well, you should have let us know earlier, damn it. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> that last one, Curse of Strahd Reddit. 
the guy who's done that is, man, he has put some stuff and effort behind that, and it is super awesome as a resource. And then there's some resources off of that that get into some other things. Um, he did a live play of, he also has a YouTube channel and did it streaming on Twitch um, called Twice Bitten Actual Play, and it's pretty damn good. What he did was he took, I think it's five players, all five of them have Game Mastered uh, Curse of Strahd. And he is running the Curse of Strahd as written, I believe. Which, because there's been a debate on whether you should run it as written or not. And so, and they've already gone through it. But, yeah. So it's uh, it's good. Uh, Curse of Strahd Reddit. Uh, I'll link in the show notes there. I think that wraps up the show for this week, Brett. What are we talking about next week, We're man? Talk a little bit about trust, man. We, you and I, have been bantering about this a bit. We've hinted at it over the years. I think let's uh, let's have let's have a talk, Sean. Let's we'll do a little virtual trust fall. <laughs> Jack Nicholson in the Batman. Who do you trust? Who do you trust? Who do you trust? <laughs> well, excellent. Yeah, looking forward to that one. Yeah, seriously though, folks, let us know what you think about the easy wins concept, right? Uh, fight skills, other ways that you've thought about easy wins and so forth. Um, do you find value in them? How do you use them? Plan them? All that good stuff. So I'm interested to see what people think. Yeah. Well, that's been another episode of Gaming and Bass. I'm Sean. And I'm Brett. Good night. Good game and all. This episode of Gaming and BS brought to you with the help from the following producers. Graham Miner, Corey Wynn, Chris Steele, Dan LaValle, Craig Huber, Ron Bishop, Rory Weston, Jeff Seifer, $1 Adventure Frameworks, Erica Villa, Daniel Garrett, Perry Besor, Mike Hess Jr., Henry Newcomb, David F. Baylog, Craig, Laramie Wall, Jason Weeb, Isaiah Aries Christian, Larry Hout, Eric Frankhouse, Niall Diamond, Corey Gonzalez, Robert Nemeth, Eric Tavola, Mark Richmond, Thomas Hook, Tony Sugarloaf Baker, George Sedgwick, Ray Otis, Old School DM, Jason Hobbs, Andy Hall, Jared Rasher, The Duke in Purple, Obscurus Dominus, Old Scouser Roleplaying, Stephen Dragonspawn, Wayne Humphrey, Phil McClory, Mark Tasaka, Jim Ingram, Roger Braslett, Angus, Jim Fitzpatrick, Pure Mongrel, Melissa Bashinsky, C.W. Mellencamp, Sky, Ray P- J. Plata, Howard Bishop, Mark Soam, Jeff Goad, Curtis Hinson, Eric Salzweedle, John Kayward, Ryan Rumble, Ghost GM, Andy Olson, Host Carl, Harrigan, Josh Wallace, Ed Nyes, Adam Grote, John, Jad Gleiman, Michael Dinos, Brett Pazinski, Rich Wishon, Merkel Froelich, and Joe Swick. Hey, thanks for supporting the show. On this episode, I'm not going to ask anybody to do anything. Do whatever you want. 2020 is completely a mess. Live a little. Thanks, BSers. This, this has, has been, been a Litterbox, Litterbox Studio, Studio production. production.